My name is Jeff Mechanic. I'm an endocrinologist and I'm here in the Cardiovascular Institute at Mount Sinai Heart, uh, Icon School of Medicine in Mount Sinai. It seems that the most popular question that I'll get from patients uh, within the context of cardiovascular disease actually is, uh, Doc, how do I lose weight? I'm here to lose weight. Uh, I've tried to lose weight. It's all about weight. It's all very weight centric. And um, I, I think what's more telling is what patients are not asking. What they're not asking is uh, how can I be more healthy? How can I prevent chronic disease? How can I prevent heart disease? So actually the whole issue about heart health is not so much these focused questions of how do I lose weight or how do I have my sugars better? How do I get my blood pressure controlled? How do I lower my cholesterol? They're all important and they're certain, certainly part of the answer. But the more significant issue is about health, about prevention of uh, chronic disease and prevention of heart disease. The major risk factors for cardiovascular disease, if you look at it as a chronic disease and in a chronic care model, you focus on drivers. You focus on the things that can cause these chronic diseases. Now, the way that I put this together is I divide drivers into primary drivers and secondary or metabolic drivers. So primary drivers are sort of what start this whole uh, nefarious process uh, in play. And that would include genetics. Uh, of course, genetics are not modifiable. Environment and certain aspects of the environment you can't modify, but other aspects you can. The built environment, the human-made environment uh, where you live and you've seen legislation and issues about super size and uh, building running paths and things like that. And then the third is really a result of the combination of genetics and environment and that's behavior. The way in which we behave, the way in which we construct our own personalized lifestyle. And it's that lifestyle that then uh, triggers or starts a chronic disease process. Now, once that process has started, it is impelled by various metabolic drivers that come into play. Uh, one of them is abnormal adiposity. Now in newer models, uh, we bring together terms such as obesity and overweight, uh, maybe fatty liver, uh, uh, findings such as fat around the heart, all in terms of abnormal adiposity. Obesity really doesn't tell the whole story. And we try actually not to use the word obesity so much anymore. It tends to be a little stigmatizing. It doesn't make you feel good if somebody's uh, referring to your medical condition in that way. A second driver is dysglycemia, D-Y-S. That means abnormal glycemia, sugar, sugar status. And what it does is it includes insulin resistance where you have normal sugars, but the process has already started that as a result of this abnormal uh, body fat that you develop insulin resistance, then it can lead into elevations in blood sugar when the cells that make insulin in the pancreas really don't work so well. Uh, early on, we call that prediabetes. Later on, when it gets a little bit more significant, we call that diabetes or type 2 diabetes when it's occurring with insulin resistance. And then later on, you get vascular blood vessel complications of the diabetes and the insulin resistance. And we pull all of those things together and refer to them as dysglycemia, a second driver, abnormal adiposity, dysglycemia. And then of course there's hypertension, which is a high blood pressure situation that can involve problems with 
diet and blood vessels and the kidney and the heart. It can have adverse effects on the brain, adverse effects on other aspects of the body. And of course, lipids or high cholesterol. And um, high cholesterol, we check blood tests for high cholesterol. It's in part influenced by genetics and also influenced by environment and, and the way we behave. And then there's a fifth type, which is residual risk. Risks for heart disease that are not entirely due to the adiposity, the sugar, the cholesterol, and the blood pressure. And this could relate to ethnicity and culture. It, it's uh, generally referred to as social determinants of health. It could be stress. It could be the way it affects your sleep. Uh, it, it's other aspects of your lifestyle that we don't generally associate with the biological uh, consequences that lead to heart disease. And um, health is really addressing all of these modifiable factors that can lead to heart disease. There are two ways to look at it. One way is to think, oh, I'm gonna to go to the doctor, the doctor will draw some tests and then I'll take some medicine and I'll treat a number. And the number comes down and then that tells me that I'm doing fine. But the other way is not to wait until there's a problem. Not wait until the blood pressure is actually high. Not wait until the sugar is so high that you're being labeled or diagnosed with type two diabetes. Not wait until the weight goes up and your BMI body mass index is so high that somebody refers to you as having obesity or, or overweight. Uh, not wait until that uh, bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol uh, reaches a certain number that various doctors would say, oh, we need to start statin therapy or start other types of medicine. Really the better way to do this is to start as early as possible to prevent these abnormalities. Prevention is key. And you know, you might ask, why haven't we been why haven't we been doing this before? I think the answer is we didn't really have great data. We didn't have a mindset uh, for prevention. There wasn't really the economics, the reimbursement uh, for preventive care, but it exists now. And that should be the new mindset to have healthy eating patterns, to be exercising every day, eating your fruits and vegetables, your beans and your lentils, and avoiding uh, sweets, uh, not all the time, but clearly most of the time. Uh, alcohol abstinence or moderation, not smoking. These are all the things that contribute to a healthy lifestyle that really help you prevent cardiovascular disease. So if there really was one message, that would be the message. Not to wait, uh, but rather to think about prevention, starting earlier, scheduling that appointment with your doctor, uh, reporting to your doctor that you're interested in prevention. Uh, if there are prescriptions that are given to you, and they may not be for medicine, the prescription may be for having adopting a certain healthy eating pattern or adopting daily physical activity and, and exercise or maneuvers to reduce stress, then adhering with those recommendations so that you are healthier and there's a longer high quality life ahead of you. Well, I, I think you need to sit back, take inventory of what your risk factors are. And certainly if there's a family history or you've had some of these other issues going on either presently or in the past, like smoking or being overweight, to consider the value make this more of an investment. Consider the value of adopting a healthy lifestyle and preventing trouble down the road. Uh, many of us attribute value to things that uh, are economic, uh, things that may have to do with emergencies or urgencies, uh, time uh, constrained actions. The problem with prevention is we're talking about in general over a long period of time. So that value gets diluted because it's something so remote 
that, oh, it's not going to happen tomorrow or in a week. I can deal with it later. But what I'm saying is to really take stock of this and attribute some value in prevention on principle. And you will reap the rewards of that attitude. So one of the other uh, issues is we've talked about the uh, principles, we've talked about strategy, we've talked about all the things that we could write about in a paper or in a book. Uh, you could read in a newspaper, a magazine, you could tune into a health podcast or a show, but it doesn't really tell you how to do it. And the first step of how to do it, how to get something done is to find a champion. Find somebody who is of like mind. Find a doctor who is sensitive to these preventive measures. Now, sometimes it could be rather difficult and you may have to spend some time uh, looking around, talking to people. And that's what I would encourage. I would actually encourage you to speak to your friends, your family. Of course, if you have a doctor, to speak to your doctor about it, to do a little bit of research, look for programs. Uh, around where you live. Uh, look at some of the major uh, medical centers. Uh, certainly here at Mount Sinai, we have plenty of programs that specialize in preventive health. Uh, many other medical centers and many other doctors uh, do it as well, but you're going to have to put a little elbow grease into this to locate doctors that are trained in traditional medicine, trained uh, at, at uh, uh, medical schools that uh, confer some expertise in preventive health and preventive cardiology, and then to meet with them, establish a consultation, and be prepared when you go to the doctor. Write down the issues that you think are important. Write down the areas that are of value for you, Write down the areas that you believe are, are represent a risk. Write down what you want in life, sort of a high level discussion on what health is. And uh, I think that's the way in which you're going to get a, uh, a very fruitful, uh, rewarding encounter uh, with your physician that hopefully would uh, extend into a good working relationship.